today we are going to talk about sensors and peripherals and later on a little bit about signal processing. Uh, I'll do only the introduction in signal processing and Andre is going to continue this afternoon with more advanced topics and how to actually process a signal. Uh, okay, so let's start. This is the outline for today. First of all, we're going to talk about the sensors that we have in the kit right here. So buttons, potentiometers, um, gas sensors, so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to make it more clear um, about the temperature sensor that we used yesterday and why we had to do some formulas. Then we're going to go on to peripherals, which are screens, LEDs, so on and so forth. And a short uh, discussion about how to make uh, signal processing. Then, any, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So sensors. Sensors are devices that uh, scan the environment and get some data from the environment. So basically, is a LED a sensor? No, definitely not. Is a temperature, thermistor, sorry, a thermistor is a sensor? Obviously, is a button a sensor? Who says yes? Who says no? Well, the button is a sensor because it sends a value. It doesn't sense the environment in its proper sense because usually we push the button, but if we put a button on a door and we close the door, the button gets pushed. So basically somehow it still senses the environment. Okay, can you give me other examples of sensors? Photoresistor, Photo infrared sensors. What are infrared sensors for? Line followers is one. Second is also distance sensors. With infrared, you can also compute distances. Okay, so let's let's move on. For sensors, we have two types. One is analog sensors, and the other one is digital sensors. What's the difference? So basically, uh, the answer was that the analog sends uh, an analog value that needs to be processed by the ADC, and the digital van value, sorry, the digital sensor sends a digital value. So basically, all the sensor, the sensing parts, are analog. Now, it depends if the sensing part is directly connected to our microcontroller, or um, the microcontroller that processes the data is already in the box of the sensor and it sends the data out on some communication channel. So this is the big difference. Usually analog sensors are really easy to interface. All you need is an ADC and then you have to do some computations to find the real value as we did with the temperature sensor yesterday. Digital sensors are more complicated because they implement some kind of a protocol so um, in order to get the data, your device needs to speak to the sensor on that protocol. So it's not a one-line um, recording. OK, so for the analog sensors, I think this is not working, we have also two types. One is with two pins, and the other type is with three pins. So as you can see here, we have a photoresistor which has two pins. And we have also a photoresistor with another part here, and it has three pins for connecting. So analog sensors are always connected in the voltage divider. So 90% of the cases, in 90% of the cases, the sensor will be a device that changes its resistance based on some environment feature. For the light sensor, the more the light, the lower the resistance. For the temperature sensor, um, the higher the temperature, the lower the resistance, something like this. So what we actually measure is the voltage drop on top of that resistor. We can extract the resistor value and deduce or compute from there the value in the environment that we wanted to measure. Now, some sensors, I said, have three pins. The ones that have three pins usually have the voltage divider inside. So as you can see, we have here the, the photocell. And this is a simple one. We need another resistor and we need to connect the photocell. But here, we have the photocell. 
and we have another part over here which is linearizing the photo cell and also uh, providing the voltage divider. So if the sensor has three pins, one usually goes to VCC, the other one goes to the ground, and the one of the pins goes to the analog input. So basically the photo cell is this one, and the sensor here is the whole voltage divider. So if a sensor has three pins, usually this is the case. Um, please be aware, do not switch VCC with ground, some sensors will burn. So, um, uh, or even worse, it's not gonna burn, it's gonna be damaged, and you're not gonna realize that it's damaged. It only, it will shout out, if you correct it, if you put it correctly afterwards, it will send you uh, bogus values. So please be aware of this. Um, another thing that we need to understand that analog sensors is that we measure with error. And if the sensor is like this, so it's only the photo cell or the thermistor, the error is large. Because there's, um, there's disturbance in the environment, and also there's a disturbance uh, in measuring the voltage on it. Sensors that come with the voltage divider and some parts usually have some corrections embedded into them, but again, we measure with errors. Also, please note, that most of the sensors are not linear. So, for instance, for the temperature sensor, the temperature, if the temperature varies linearly, like it's a, it's a line, the resistor uh, will vary exponentially. If you remember yesterday, you, have a log you had a logarithm over there. So be aware of this. It's not, uh, in most of the cases, they are not linear, and they have really uh, high errors. Um, one simple way to correct errors in reading or errors that uh, occur due to the fact that the circuitry is not perfect is to mean them, to average them. So basically, instead of making one read, we will make 100 reads and simply average the value. Hmm. Is this understandable? So th this is really, really important. It's a really poor error correction system, but it's still good. Uh, if you graph a sensor and you read uh, something really fast, you will see spikes on the graphs. Uh, by averaging values that you read, do you read? Sorry, um, you will eliminate those spikes. Those spikes. So this is really really important. Um, usually, you would average 1,000 samples. That's where you go. On microcontrollers, this works. On these computer boards, sometimes averaging values will actually result in reading the same value from the same memory space. So the pin will never update. You will read it so fast that basically you will get a memory value and the memory value will not get updated from the ADC. So please be aware of this as well. We always measure the V out in the um, voltage divider. So let's go to the button. The button is one of the simplest sensors that uh, you can connect, and it's the one that usually people connect really bad, like really badly. Um, in fact, the button is an analog sensor, uh, just that it can report two values, either one, either zero. Why? If the button is released, so this is the button, the switch over here, if it's released, the resistance between the, 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 these two points is infinite. So basically, this resistance will be so small in, comp in comparison with the resistance of the button that we will measure almost the full uh, voltage drop. Conversely, if the button is pressed, this becomes a cable. So this becomes zero. The input is going to be directly connected to the ground. So this is why the button is, is in fact an analog sensor, but it goes to the extremes. So its resistance will be either zero, either infinite. So in this schematics, what, what va wh why do I need this resistance over here? So this can be explained really easily. If this resistance lacks, yes? For instance, we, we would have only the switch, and it would, would go through R2 into the input. What happens when the button is pressed? What is the value that we will read here? Sorry? What? Ground, which is? Zero. So when the button is pressed, this is clear. We're going to read zero. What if the button is up? What's the value that we read? Keep in mind, we don't have R1. 
we have it, but it's not connected to this point. R1 does not exist. So we don't have the voltage supply. We don't, we don't know the value because this is in the air. So an open circuit is not one and is not zero. It depends on the, the value in the air. It depends on the electricity charge in the air. So there's no way we could say this is one or zero. I've seen this mistake yesterday, twice. So please be aware, a, a switch will be, the switch, one of the switch spins and the input pin of the computer or the embedded board will be in the air. What happens if we connect the five volts directly here, so R1 is zero? If the button is not pressed, how much do we read here? So this resistance is uh, zero, we have a cable which goes here. We read five volts. If we press the button, short circuit. So careful to this. This is called a pull-up resistor. It actually pulls up the pin. When the button is not pressed, it pulls up the voltage up to five. That's why it's called a pull-up. How, how do we choose this? We need a really small resistor so that when we press the button, so, sorry, so that um, when the button is in the air, the voltage drop will be significantly low here, so that we can still read 5 volts, because we're not going to read 5 volts here, we're going to read 4.9 probably bec due to the resistor. Now, if it's really low, it's a really small resistor, what happens when we press the button? Okay, question? We're not going to burn R1 because it, you cannot burn a resistor. You need to have a really strong current, and I don't think this VCC will supply that. But it's going to draw a lot of current from the VCC. So basically, if this resistance is small and it's connected directly to the ground, um, the only uh, stop in front of the current coming from VCC is that resistor, the small one. So the current is going to be rather high, and it's going to drain the 5 volts really fast. So if we connect this to a power source or a power plug in the, in the wall, that's fine. But if it's a device that works in battery, that's a problem. And if this button is pressed only for a very short amount of time, again, that's fine. But if it's pressed for a longer amount of time, for instance, it's a door sensor, then it's a problem. So we need to choose a resistance sufficiently high so that we won't drain the source really fast, but sufficiently low to be able to read uh, a value of one. So this uh, goes like this. You need to know how the input is uh, working and what's the value, um, what's the, uh, the step where it starts reading one and you need to adapt the resistor accordingly. Usually one K resistor would be fine. Um, so this is with the button. What happens with if we put um, S1 instead of R1, and R1 instead of S1. I think it's vice versa. If you press the button here, it's going to be zero. So, so when you press the button, it becomes one. And if you release the button, it becomes zero. If R1 is placed underneath here, it's called the pull down resistor. It will pull down the voltage from this point to the ground the moment the button is not pressed. The moment the button is pressed, it will uh, stop the current from, doing a uh, from flowing too fast, like flowing too fast, and having a short circuit. And uh, the input is going to be connected to VCC. Is this um, clear up to here? Any questions? If, if it's not clear, please ask. This is the most difficult problem for beginners in embedded devices. It's somehow sometimes hard to understand why we need to do this. And what I'm saying is, uh, remember that everything has to be measured in a voltage divider, and the button is actually a sensor. In, but instead of being a variable resistance, it's simply a resistance which can be zero or infinite. Debouncing. <laughs> this is tricky. Usually this does not happen on computers or on embedded boards. On microcontrollers, this is really visible. Buttons are imperfect. So the moment you start pressing the button, you have a short time where the button's uh, connectors start approaching. And if the distance is really small, you have an electric discharge. This implies 
that the resistance will be not will be different from zero, but different from infinite. So for a short amount of time, when you press it, the resistance is going to vary. If you plug something in the power socket, uh, sometimes you see a flame. That's the same thing, just that the current in the power socket is way more strong, uh, way stronger. For the button, you cannot see the frame, the sparks, but it still happens. So if you use a scope, this is what we see. This is the button uh, while released, and when we press it, it starts juggling like this and going up to one. Now this is called bouncing. So what's the problem? The problem is with the microcontroller, you will sample it here, you will sample it here, you will sample it here, so on and so forth, and you will see zeros and ones continuously changing. So if you need to measure, for instance, the time that a button has been pressed, so if you only need to detect the press of a button, that's fine. But if you need to count how many times you press the buttons, you will count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven probably, instead of only one. Or if you need to measure the time that the button was pressed, again, you will measure this. So it depends on the microcontroller, but if it's really fast, you have an issue. So one way of debouncing is, is to average the value. And if the average does not is not zero or not one, is something in between, then the button bounced. And then simply discard the measurement. Another way is um, to use a hardware circuitry, a hardware trigger, it's called a monostable circuit, which detects an edge, and then for a certain amount of time never reads another value. But this is tricky again, because if somehow the air discharges along the button or you put a magnet, not a magnet, but something electrical close to the button, you might have the same behavior for a short amount of time, or if you move it. And a monostable circuitry will detect an edge there. So that's not the best choice. Another way in software is to put a trigger. So when you see a button one, just trigger it for amount, an amount of time, and then uh, there's no way you will detect other, um, you, you won't detect these edges, because you won't read the button for a, a short amount of time. My suggestion is average the value anyway. Check if it's zero or one, if the average is really zero or one. And if it's not, simply discard it and do another measurement. Is it clear? Particularly on microcontrollers where buttons can be triggered by interrupts, where you can trigger an interrupt in this case, this might be a really bad idea. Um, some circuitry know, uh, some microcontrollers know uh, how to debounce this automatically. So if the microcontroller is more expensive, it will have debouncing circuitry. Mm, and anybody heard about FPGAs? They have debouncing circuitry, so that, that's fine. This is another issue. Usually it's not seen on embedded boards. Why? Why don't we see it on embedded boards? Because they don't sample so fast. That's the answer, they don't sample that fast. <laughs> So most probably won't be able to sample the, here. You will sample it somewhere here, and then again, the next sample is going to be here. So if one sample is here and one sample is here, that, that's just fine. So if your sampling rate is, uh, the sampling period is larger than this one, you will simply see it one or zero, and that's it. So that concludes the buttons. Potentiometer, what's a potentiometer? It's a variable resistance. So basically, it's. Have you used one? Where? At home. Most of the appliances have potentiometers. Like if you um, move, if you make an adjustment with a button that goes round, that's a potentiometer. If the button goes continuously round, like um, for instance, new speakers where you have a remote where you can turn up the volume, turn up the volume up and down or you have another round button where you can do the same thing but it goes to infinite, that's not a potentiometer. Do you know how that is made? If it's a button that goes around continuously, it's made with two buttons. If you um, move it to the right, it will press a button each time it goes um, through a click, and if you move it left, it will press another button each time it goes to, the, to that, the, the other click. So that's not a potentiometer. But if it goes, uh, it has a certain amount of um, degree of freedom, a certain degree of freedom in one way and another way, that's probably a potentiometer. So this, this has three pins. 
Usually it's a full resistor and the pin is connected in the middle. So you have a resistor of let's say 10K. So the, those are the uh, outer pins. And the middle pin is the one that can uh, float around the resistor of 10K and split it into two resistors. So basically if the button, if the pin, the pin is not moving, inside it moves, the connection moves, in, moves inside. If the connection is at the middle, you will have a 5K resistor and a 5K resistor. It's a voltage divider. So it's clearly a voltage divider, as you can see. Uh, I haven't seen potentiometers which have uh, less than three pins, so. Okay, so basically, there's two ways of connecting a potentiometer. Either we make a voltage divider, choose R1, and connect two of the pins of the potentiometer in the voltage divider, and those two have to be the middle pin and one of the extremities. Second, the second way of connecting it is one pin to VCC, one pin to ground, so the outer pins connected them to the power source, VCC and ground, and the middle pin connected, uh, you have to connect the middle pin to the input. So this is the way. It's very simple for the potentiometer, no, nothing complicated, two ways of using it, so just go ahead. Um, please be aware of one thing. Um, some potentiometers go up to zero. So if you fry something, so if you use those pins, those only two of the pins, you might fry something. So um, if it goes to zero, you might actually do something wrong. So just be aware that one of the resistance can be zero. Okay, light sensor. We have, I think we used, used this yesterday. It's a photo cell. Um, it's a resistor. It's a semiconductor resistance, which is uh, light dependent. Means if it gets photons, it lowers its uh, resistance. It becomes a better conductor um, if it gets photons. This is how you can remember it. So the photoresistor has a high resistance if it's dark. The more photons it gets, the more electrons ca can go through the semiconductor. So its resistance goes down. Basically, uh, we will measure, in most of the cases, the inverse of the light. So if we measure the voltage drop on the light sensor, if we have more light, this resistance becomes lower, so we will measure a smaller value. If we connect it on top, we will measure a higher value. Once again, I've seen sensors which are only the photocell and also sensors which have um, voltage divider on them and also a linearizing system. This sensor is not linear. It looks like this. When, when we have uh, no light, sorry, when we have no light, the resistance is really high when we have light, the resistance is really low. And conversely here. So this is what we measure. If we put it here, we'll measure like this. If we put it on the top, we'll measure it like this. Very, very important. It's not linear. It's exponential. So the more light you get, the smaller the change in some cases. So this requires some math to linearize it. Or if you use a sensor like this, this is already linear. This has a circuitry over here, which provides the voltage divider and also provides the mathematical functions to make a line, so to make a straight graph like this. Any questions here? Temperature sensor. This looks complicated. This is a really uh, bad one. So the worst idea that you can have is to measure the temperature directly with the thermoresistor. It's very, very, it's very um, prone to errors. So you will not read the correct temperature. And it's really, it, it's a really nasty curve. So basically, the thermistor has two uh, parameters. It has more, but two very important. The resistance, its resistance at 25 degrees centigrade, 
usually around 5k. And the constant, which is called b, which uh, provides the characteristic of the curve. Usually that's around 3,000 up to 5,000, depending on the model. Depending on what is written on the thermistor, you need to search those online. Small changes into these values give you other values from, for the temperature. So if the values are not accurate, your temperature measurement will be really off. Um, so how do we compute it? First of all, we connect it into the a voltage divider. And afterwards, we start measuring. We will measure the voltage. So this is how we obtain the voltage, the value that we uh, read. Uh, with the three simple rule, we obtain the voltage. Afterwards, we compute the resistance of the thermistor, knowing, uh, but th this is a mistake here, knowing the resistance that we connected, and then we compute a ratio knowing the resistance of a thermistor and its resistance at 25 degrees. So pl please be aware these are switched. So we can compute this resistance based on knowing the voltage over here, knowing the reading over here, and knowing this resistance. And then we compute a certain ratio, which linearizes the graph based on R and uh, its resistance at 25 degrees. And then we can compute with this formula its temperature. Temperature is computed in Kelvin. So you need to subtract 273.15 out of it. 0.15, I think it's completely irrelevant. The measurement is so off that it's not going to matter. So thermistors are only for having a rough idea of what temperature you have. If you have a monitoring device that needs to monitor some device and a really precise temperature, never ever think of using something like this. So this is just to give you an idea, OK, it's warm outside, so I can go with light clothes. And no, it's, it's really cold, so I need to get a jacket. So this, this is somehow the only thing that you can use this. Really, really bad. A better temperature sensor, or better temperature sensor are the LM circuits. LM35 is just an example, but you have more, more circuits like this. This is the temperature sensor. It has a, a uh, sorry, it has a thermistor inside, but has additional circuitry for linearizing and error correction. As you can see, it has three pins. So what do we do? How do we connect them? One to VCC, one to ground, and usually um, one to uh, the measurement. It's not the middle pin. If I remember correctly, it's the first one. Search the data sheet. If you put this vice versa, so you reverse ground and VCC, it literally burns. Like, you, it will, you will fry it. It's really hot, and you can burn yourself by touching it, and it also smokes. So we, we, have ex we have a lot of experience in, in the field. Um, it's really easy to measure. You measure the voltage, and uh, you multiply it by 100. So that, that's all that you need to do. Uh, sorry, something is wrong here. You measure the voltage. I think you divide it by 10. Sorry. <laughs> so no. No, you multiply by 10, the voltage. voltage. Some, somehow this is a mistake over here. So all you need to do is measure the voltage and then multiply it by a factor, and this is it. it uh, the multiplication factor depends also on the device. So just go and read the data sheet, but it goes really, really quickly, and it's linear. So if the temperature gr uh, grows at a certain rate, the voltage will grow at the same rate. So this is good. This is a good one. It's not expensive. It's more expensive than the, the thermistor, but still it works. It worth, it's, wor it's worth it. Sorry. Gas sensor. Do not use it at home. So never ever use something like this to detect gas leakage at home. This is only for um, nice projects that you do for yourself and that you use in any environment which is not life-threatening. So this sensor detects carbon monoxide. It detects it really well. But if you have a mistake in the circuit, if your program is wrong, it won't alert you. 
So never ever use a sensor like this, which is really cheap to detect gas. Please go to um, professional uh, hardware stores and buy professional certified equipment for detecting gas at home. So don't do don't improvise like this. This is good for measuring noxes in your car, for measuring the environment for your own sake, for doing a tree house and measuring the carbon dioxide in in the air and stuff like this. Never ever measure at home. Some stores won't even solder the parts for you because they do not want to be liable in case you do something stupid. No, this is no joke. So one store simply refused to solder our sensors. That's another issue. If you solder it wrong, it won't alert you again. So don't use it at home. Three pins, VCC, signal and ground. Usually it has four, one is not connected. It's written NC on the pin that's not connected. The sensor heats up really bad, so do not touch the sensor while it's working. It can heat up uh, at more than 60, and it needs to heat up. So when you connect the sensor, please allow it uh, a few seconds to heat up. So don't, don't be scared, it really heats, but this is how it measures. This is the procedure in measure, measuring uh, the gas. So this is necessary to heat it up. Form factor is really interesting. Usually th these sensors are um, labeled with MQ, MQ2, MQ3, MQ4, MQ up to I think MQ7 I've seen. They measure different type of gases. I think this is carbon monoxide. Same thing. Distance sensor. How do we measure the distance? Waves. What kind of waves? Sound. One is sound waves. The second one. Mm, you can do that, but that's with contact, without contacting. With light waves, or electromagnetic waves. Um, one of the sensors is, of the di one of the distance sensors uh, is SRF04. It's an ultrasonic sensor. Basically, it's a sonar. Bats use it. If you, I think we have bats somewhere here because if you uh, hear something screaming really lightly in the night, it's a bat which uses its sonar. This is an ultra ultrasonic sonar. Uh, what does it do? So it has three pins, uh, sorry, four. One is the ground, one is the VCC, and one is the trigger pin. The moment it sees a pulse on the trigger pin, it will send out a signal, an ultrasonic signal, and wait for its reply, for its echo. So the moment it finishes sending out the signal, it has a fourth pin, which is called uh, echo pin, that is connected to your device and you sample it. The moment it's, it finishes sending the uh, ultrasonic pulse, it will make the echo pin one, and when it receives the echo response, it will make the echo pin zero. How do we measure the distance? No, but from the, our point of view, from the software point of view. We measure the time of, the time uh, where the echo line is high. Excuse me? Exactly, so we can multiply that with the speed of, with the speed of sound, sorry, not the speed of light, uh, and we can get the distance. Me the method is nice, really fast, really unusable on embedded devices. Why? You can't measure this thing exactly. You will sample probably here, then here, and probably up here. The time is so short, the pulse is sh so short, you cannot sample it. We did not succeed with doing this with, an, a raspberry, with a raspberry Pi and with Intel Edison, not even using high priority drivers. System is still too slow. With a microcontroller you can, because you are the only software that runs on it, so you can precisely know, you know exactly how much time a measurement is going to take. So basically you won't be able to measure this. We are talking from, to, from microseconds to milliseconds, but microseconds you cannot measure. Okay, so sensors are really cool, but only for microcontrollers. What you can do with this sensor is connect it to a microcontroller and shout out the values on a serial line. 
and then on the embedded device just read the serial line and then you will have the distance. Again, this is really error prone, so you need to average the values and also Andre will tell you about what corrections you need to make because this is not very sensitive in some areas. Also, it depends how you put objects in front of it. But still, it's pretty accurate. The second way of measuring distance is with an infrared sensor. It's this one over here. It has three pins. It has the VCC, the ground, and an analog output pin. This uses infrared light to measure the distance, and inside it has a digital to analog converter so that it reports an analog value depending on the distance. You can sample this. So you, you simply have to do an analog read and then uh, use the formulas in the data sheet to convert it to the distance. The problem with this sensor is that depending on it, its construction, uh, it will function on certain, in certain distance ranges. If the sonar works from its very first point up to a certain range, this one does not. You will see this afternoon, this sensor has a, a part in front of it where it's not sensible, and if you go really f far away, it's not sensible again. And not sensible means it gives errors. It gives values completely out of range. And, uh, like meaning not out of range, but values which are not real. So you will have an object really close, and it will say it's very far away. So please be aware, it, as it's easier to in interface, uh, like in engineering, if something is easy, it has to be, have some downside. So the downside of this sensor is that it's not that sensible. The downside of this one, it's very, sen it's very good in sensing, but it uses the pulse. A real, really good combination would be to take this sensor, put a microcontroller next to it, sample the data, and send the data back to uh, our embedded board. Either by a digital line, either by put, putting a digital to analog converter on this one. So that's the only way. Uh, please be aware, we, you will find examples with the sensors on the internet. They say they work, they never worked for us. Okay, so this concludes the analog sensors that I wanted to talk about. We have all of them except this one, the um, ultrasonic sensor, which we cannot reuse. Digital sensors. Digital sensors are basically analog sensors bundled with a microcontroller which send out data to uh, some, pro some digital pro uh, bus. Sorry, to some digital bus. What I want to talk about is not about uh, the digital sensors, but about these two protocols. So basically, you will need um, to use digital sensors. I would suggest using sensors that either know SPI, either know I square C. I'm not going to describe every sensor because every sensor is different in the sense that it needs a library or a driver. So for analog sensors, it's enough to make an analog read. For these ones, as they use protocols, you will need some kind of library which knows the protocol and knows how to interact with the sensor. So each digital sensor will come with its library. The data sheet will have the explanation of how to use the protocol but still, it's going to take a lot of time to write the library. Search online, you can find almost anything. We will use digital sensors for temperature and for accelerometer. They are much more accurate because they have corrections on their board. SPI. SPI protocol looks like this. So basically, in SPI, you have a master and several slaves. Communication is always initialized by the master. So slaves, even if they have data which they need to transmit, cannot do this until the master decides it needs data. The pins of the bus are MOSI, MISO, SCLK, and several SS pins. MOSI is master out slave in. It's this line. And it's the line for sending data from the master to the slave. So the master will have a zero resistance here. The, the slave will have an infinite resistance on the other side. So basically, this is an output pin. This is an input pin. 
it has a miso line, which is master in, slave out. Conversely, master will sample the in line, the miso line, and the slave will write on the miso line. SCLC is the SPI clock. That is generated by the master. So slaves receive the clock, never generated. Slave select are several pins. So each slave has the clock, MOSI, MISO pin, and an SS pin, one SS pin. If the SS is, is, is zero, the slave is active. So when it receives a clock, it can transmit data. When SS is one, the slave is inactive and disconnects all the inputs over here. All the outputs over there, sorry. So the moment SS becomes one for a slave, the slave will disconnect all the three pins over here. So basically the slave will act as if it does not exist. This is why we can connect the bus, the lines together for all the slaves. The master on the other hand has to have a pin for each slave so that it can um, enable and disable each slave. You can never have two slaves um, enabled. If you do this, they will have a problem on the MISO line. MISO line is going to send data to the master and also send data to the other slave. But this slave is going to do the same thing, so there's a collision of data and also the slaves might fry because you are trying to put a voltage into an output pin. Is this um, understandable? So I'm, I'm not sure if this is very clear. These pins are not, ne not really necessary. If you have only one slave, you can directly connect its SS to the ground. So you can have three pins, connect the slave to the ground, the slave is always active, and the master has only one slave. So as for speeds, it can go um, to several kilobits per second, so it's really fast. Um, but this is the limitation. The problem with this protocol is that it uses a lot of lines. This is how a transmission looks like. So this is the clock. Do you know what a clock signal is? So this is the clock signal. The moment SS goes down for a slave, at every rising edge, also it can be configured to be on the falling edge. It's simply sampling will be here instead of here. The slave and the master will transmit data simultaneously. So when the master has data for the slave, the slave needs to transmit data to the master. So basically on SPI, the transmission is an exchange of data. Master the master sends one byte, the slave sends one byte. If the slave has no data for the master, it will simply send a bogus byte. So th this is the drawback of the protocol. It's duplex, but you always get a byte from the slave when you send it a byte. After the transmission in is done, as you can see, the SS goes up, MISO and MOSI lines go to high impedance. So it, they disconnect. The slave simply disconnects. Do you have any questions regarding this? Yes, please. So what exactly does the master send to the sensor? Because the sensor sends data, but the master what? Okay, so the question was, what does the master send to the sensor? SPI is not used only for sensors. It's also used for Trans data transmission between uh, components. For a sensor, it might send, um, if a, a digital sensor might have more analog sensor on top of it. For instance, we have a sensor which, is, uh, which measures pressures and pressure and temperature. So the master might send a value telling the sensor which value it should send back. But once again, the master will send some data and the master needs to send another data uh, in order to get the, the answer back. So usually if it's a sensor, you might just send a zero byte or any byte for that matter and the sensor will simply return the value. So uh, as you have the option to disregard the value of the sensor, you have the, op the slave has the option to disregard your value. Um, is it, um, does this answer the question? Okay, so going further, I square C. I square C was done by Intel, I think, several years ago. It's uh, something with interconnection, inter 
interconnection. IC comes from interconnection, I think. It's IIC. I'm, I'm having a lapsus right now. Usually it's called I2C or I square C. It's similar to SPI in the sense that uh, you have a master and several slaves, but in SPI you can have more than one masters. They can decide which ones uh, connect, uh, sorry, control the bus. So, you, we will take the simple example where we have one master and several slaves. The interesting fact is that SPI only uses two lines. It has the SDA lines or serial data line and SCL, the serial clock line. I, I hope I'm not mistaken with serial. So SDA and SCL. The serial data line, the SDL line, is used both for transmission and receiving. Clock line is always generated by the master. Speeds go to, for standard S I square C, the speed is 100 kilobits. It can go up to 3.4 megabit. So basically, speed in I square C is not negotiated, and neither is in SPI. So speeds are fixed. If the master and the slave need to know ahead, what uh, need to know ahead the speed that will, they will be communicating. So they will not negotiate. If they know uh, different speeds, they will not understand each other. So this is going to be bad here. Okay. So for ask I square C. Um, it's a half duplex protocol, as it uses only one data line. The line is either used for transmission, either for reception, from the master's point of view, and from the slave, the same. What is also missing here? So we have the clock, we have one data line. There's something else missing. The slave select. There's no slave select. This is a bus. So basically, all the slaves see all the information on the bus. That's not an issue, necessarily. But when transmitting, how does a slave know um, if it need tr needs to transmit data or not? Based on? On what? On a clock? No. Each slave has an address. It's like in networking. If you have networking background, it's like the MAC address. It's not on f 48 bits. It's on um, 7 bits. But each slave has an address. So when communicating, the master, the master sends the clock, the master starts communication exactly like an SPI. The master will first send the device address. All the slaves receive the address. The slave that recognizes its address will be the one transmitting and talking to the master. Afterwards, the master says, OK, I want to read or I want to write. Write means I want to send you data. Read means I want you to send me data. So I need data from you. Need data from you. Uh, it sends an acknowledge bit, a byte, sorry. And then it receives or sends data. Afterwards, we have an acknowledge and a stop sign. We also have a start sign. This is how a communication over I square C works. Also, the master is able to query the slaves. So basically, you have a command on the computer on the embedded board, it's called I square C detect, I two C detect. Well, you can see all the slaves that are connected. Basically, it, how does it scan? Exactly, it scans from zero up to the highest address, highest possible address. It sends out uh, probably a read, and it waits for a reply. If there's no reply, then there's no slave, or the slave is misfunctioning. What happens if two slaves have the same uh, address? Both, talk, both talking, they might get damaged, so do not connect uh, to slaves with the same address. Usually slaves have a fixed address and some switches or jumpers for the last bits of the address. So if, for instance, we have two sensors of the same type on I square C, if the address would be fixed, we could not connect them directly. We would, we would need some kind of multiplexer to switch between them, but we can connect them with uh, the jumpers. So we put the jumper in a way on one uh, device and the, the, jump, the ju same jumper in another way on the second device. So th then they have a different address. So when you buy S I square C devices, most of the times you will see uh, jumpers on it, where you can fix the last bits of the addresses. 
So this is how we differentiate between them. Also, we can, um, if the master wants a certain uh, address for that kind of slave, we can use some uh, multiplexer on other pins. We connect um, the master bits, no, sorry, the master, the jumper bits to some bits on the microcontroller and decide which slave, uh, decide each slave addr slave's address dynamically. So instead of putting jumpers, we connect them to outputs on our board and we can fix dynamically its address. But th this is beyond the scope. But wh what you need to remember is that each slave has an address and uh, it's either a read or either a write. Either data to the slave or data from the slave. Any questions here? So protocol is really good, but it's good for uh, communicating a small amount of data. On embedded devices, um, we use other buses to communicate with each other. Usually either USB, either networking. These two connection, these two buses, SPI and I2C, were built for uh, peripherals, which do not have the memory necessary to implement a USB stack or a network stack. Remember, Arduino had two kilo of RAM and 32 kilobytes of program memory. This is not enough for a USB stack, a full USB stack or a full network stack. So this is why we have I2C. So if we compare microcontrollers to computers or embedded boards, microcontrollers can be slaves or masters. Because usually um, you have a chip for being a master, but you can simulate a slave. And sometimes the chip in the microcontroller also, also has a slave cap capability. But due to the fact that the uh, microcontroller is real time, you can make a software SPI. So you can keep up with the clock with no problem. On an embedded board, this is not the, an option. You cannot sample or send signals that fast. So the only option on embedded boards is to, be, uh, to use, it, use a hardware chip and the embedded boards that we've seen have only the master capability. And usually this is, this is because um, you will never communicate between two embedded boards over I2C or SPI. You have networking and you have USB. I2C the same. So microcontrollers are better at these protocols. Computers use a hardware device. So you have a driver, an SPI driver or I2C driver and Basically, in Linux, you write into a file and read from a file. So this is abstracted from you. OK, any questions up to here? Peripherals. Are these peripherals? Some of them. I didn't find a picture only with peripherals. So the screen is, the LED is, the relay is. Do you know what the relay is? A relay, so this one over here with the green and the black thing, is an um, electronic switch. So instead of having a manual switch to switching on and off the light, you have an electronic one. It has uh, three pins over here, the VCC, the ground, and the signal pin. When you input uh, zero signal, it will disconnect the cables over here. When you put a one signal, it will connect the cables over here. Here you have two cables on the green part. You have two cables which have high voltage. So that would be the cables for uh, a fan, for instance, a big fan on the ceiling. So instead of having a switch on the wall, you will take out the switch, put the relay instead of the switch, and you can control the fan from a device. Because we can control a LED, but we cannot control a LED bulb directly from our embedded board. We do not have the necessary current. Or we can control a small fan, but a big fan is impossible. The, it's an electronic switch. The simplest peripheral is the LED. It's a diode, two LEDs, two legs, sorry, an anode and a cathode, plus and minus. The LED lights up if it gets a voltage greater than 0 0.6, usually. Up to 0 0.6 volts on its pins, difference of voltage on its pins, its resistance is infinite. Afterwards, it drops to zero immediately. So don't forget, put the resistance on the way. So LEDs, connect LEDs with a resistor on the way. Otherwise, you fry the LED, and you might fry the board and the power source of the board. It will draw too much current. 
Um, you already connected LEDs, so I'm not going to insist on this. Seven segment displays. Do you know them? Yes, you do. Seven segment displays are in all the radios and all the appliances that you bought 10 years ago and they didn't have really cool screens. Now they started switching to screens. But mostly these ones are still used. What's a seven uh, LED display? Seven segment display. Exactly. So it has seven LEDs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven LEDs, and an eighth one with the point, which is the point. So basically, there is no difference in connecting seven actual LEDs to an embedded board with connecting a seven segment display. The form factor is different, but from the electronic point of view, you simply connect seven LEDs. Um, Usually they have a common cat cathode or common anode, meaning or either the uh, minus, either the plus leg is connected together, so all the seven LEDs, actually eight with the pin, have one leg connected together, the other legs outside. Common cathode means common minus, correct? So how does the LED light up? It needs which value on the other pin? One. If it's common anode, it needs zero. So careful, common anode uh, seven segment displays have the plus connected uh, together, so you have to connect that pin to VCC, and you will light up LEDs by putting zero on your pins. This is counterintuitive, but it happens. So you can find them both. How many pins do we need to control a display like this? 16. No, no, the, the simple one, the one, one digit. Eight. Uh, I would say nine. Uh, it's also the ground. So you need the ground and eight LEDs because we have the point. If you don't have the point, it's only eight. So for two digits, how many do we need? It's not ten. Uh, that's the way. So the simpler answer for two digits would be... Um, one ground and uh, let's say we don't use the points, 14 data pins, which is unacceptable. 10, why 10? Yes, yes, but if you don't use a multiplexer. So this, the simple answer would be 14, which is unacceptable. The second answer, which Rezvan says, you can use a multiplexer. That means we have the seven uh, pins connected for controlling the lights. We will take this example, so the one on the left. So the seven pins are connected together. So basically, we, we connect the LEDs together. So if we don't have a multiplexer, it will say show the same digit on both sides. Yes? Now. If we have a multiplexer, let's say we have a common anode system, yes? So that means the common pin is the plus. What we will do is, for a very short amount of time, make one of the anodes zero. That means none of the LEDs will light up, because the plus is connected to minus. So there will never be a voltage drop of zero Zero 0.5, it will be maybe minus zero 0.5, but never zero 0.5, zero 0.6, sorry, zero 0.6. And the other anode is connected to one. So at that certain amount of, uh, point, at that certain point in time, only one digit will be lit up. After a short period of time, we switch. We connect the first anode to one, and the second anode to zero. Th this, the other digit will be active, and we change the values on the data pins. Switching this really fast, will we'll simulate two digits. In fact, you have only one, but your eyes cannot detect this. If you have a high-speed camera, you will see it switches. Do you understand? This is very well suited for microcontrollers, very bad for embedded boards. Why? 
just as a note, you can switch fast enough. So the, the amount of time you need for your eyes is fast enough. You can do it from the embedded board. Why is it bad? That's the problem. Even if you have more projects running, so if you have one project running, you have to switch it really fast and you can't do other things in your project. Secondly, CPU goes really high on this. Because timing needs to be pretty exact. You cannot use somehow you slip. And CPU is going to be very, very high because it switches really, really fast. It needs to send data. So you cannot say, OK, I, I've written the digit. It stays like that. You really have to switch the pins. So this is not an option for embedded boards. So no way. For microcontrollers, this is fine. What you can do is to use a microcontroller, connect the seven segment display to it, and use SPI, I2C, or the serial port to send a, a value to the microcontroller and let the microcontroller handle the display. This is the most common usage. Uh, in your computer, each peripheral, from the hard drive to um, the USB controller to your, um, what do you have on, in the computer? Your fan, even the fan, they all have some uh, microcontroller integrated. The CPU only talks to that microcontroller and the microcontroller does its job and uh, controls the peripheral. Is it clear? The most known peripheral is the video card. N now it's another CPU, and it's faster than the CPU in most of the cases. But at the beginning, it was simply a microcontroller controlling the display. And the computer would say, OK, you need to display this, and the video card would handle this. So this is one way to do it. But sometimes this can be difficult. So we will use a shift register. What's a shift register? This is the nice piece that I was talking about, the 595, 74,595. 74, Do you know a shift register? Have you heard about this? This is a serial to parallel shift register. It has a lot of pins. So this is how the chip looks like. Please notice the key over here, this round thing. So when you take the chip, look at it. It will have um, a round thing on the top. Keep it on the same, in the same way and look at the pins. Do not power it, uh, um, do not power it um, inversely, not inversely. Do not switch the power supply, like put the VCC to the ground and ground to VCC. It burns, literally burns, heats up really fast. And it's not good if it hits up. OK, so first of all, we have QA. If it's a register, it's a memory. Register means memory. So the data memorized is sent out from QA to QH. So QA and QB, C, D, E, F, G, H. So whatever is stored in that register is being sent out to these pins. These are output pins, always output pins. If you put the value, it sends out the value in the second base, in base number two. OE means output enable. If OE is zero, output is fine. If OE is one, the chip is disconnected. It means that it won't output the value on the queues. It will make a high resistance or high impedance. It's as if the chip would be disconnected completely. It would not be there. That's op output enable. Ser, not sen, ser is serial input. We'll talk about this. SR clock is the serial clock. R clock is the register clock or the latch. And as SR clock, SR CLR, CLR is the clear. QH prime is another output. And we'll discuss this at the shifting part. So it's clear how to get out data from it. How do we put data inside it? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. OK. So basically, we shift data inside. How? It's similar to SPI in a way. Uh, sometimes it's called bit banging. Thing is like this. 
you have a serial clock. Each time the serial clock goes from 0 to 1, or depending on the construction, it can go from, zero, uh, from 1 to 0. So on each rising or falling edge, depending on the chip, the register will read the SER value, put QH into QH prime, put QG into QH, QF into QG, QE in QF, QD in QE, QC in QD, QB in QC, QA in QB, and SER in QA. So it pushes the bits with one position. The second time the clock goes up, it does the same. Um, if the clock is zero or one, it does nothing. Is it clear? If we want to change all the values from QA to QH, how many cycles do we need? Eight. So we need to generate eight pulses and give it eight pieces of information. So this is why it's a serial to parallel. Output is parallel. The output is parallel. I can read all the bits at a time. I cannot put inside the register eight bits at a time. I can put only one bit at a time. Why do I have the QH prime? Sorry? No, that, that's a bit. QH prime is a bit. But why do I have the ninth bit, the bit that was shifted out? Mm, not quite. It's for. No, no, no. It's not rotating. You, you can do that if you connect it to SCR. You sh you sh you rotate, but no, you can connect another uh, register. So this QH can be connected to the SER line on another register. If I need 16 bits, it's called daisy chaining. So basically, if I have two registers like this, I will generate the data on SER. I will generate the clock for both registers. And once this shifts out, the other one shifts this bit in. So in 16 cycles, I can place 16 uh, values in two registers using three lines, actually two lines, because the control of the register is done via a clock, this clock, SRCLK, and the SER line. So I can control eight outputs with two lines. Is it clear? I can control 16 outputs with two lines, the same two lines. The only uh, uh, disadvantage is it will take more time for all the outputs to update. Uh, but that, that's not an issue. So it's so fast, even for embedded boards, it's so fast that it's no problem. Some embedded boards we had that had a glitch that were um, Switching digital write really low, and you could see how the register switch switches. But otherwise, it's a one-time thing. What's the uh, R uh, SR CLR, CLR? That's the clear. The moment uh, this one. So while this is one, everything works fine. When this becomes zero, the register is cleared out, meaning it's zero. All the bits in the register become zero. So usually, if I don't need this, I will simply connect this to VCC. But if I want, I can asynchronously clear the register. Now, what's this clock, R clock? The problem with shift registers is that while I shift, outputs change. And if I need to change all the eight outputs at a time, the peripheral that is connected will see the switch, will see the shift. Is it clear? So I need to hide this somehow. So this is actually a double register. Inside, it has the 8-bit shift register, which actually shifts values and outputs the values as they shift. And we have another 8-bit latch, or parallel to parallel reg register. So this one loads values only when this latch clock goes from 1 to 0, or from 0 to 1. Depends on the data sheet. It will disregard any inputs except 
the moment that this clock shifts, uh, sorry, switches. So basically, why I'm, while I'm shifting inside data, if I'm not touching the R clock, outputs will not change, uh, except the QH. So Q, uh, sorry, QH prime will change, yes? But QA to QH will never change. So once I shifted all the values that I needed, I will simply have to generate a clock pulse to update the outputs. It's like a slot machine somehow you put inside money. It does nothing until you pull the handle. You have shift registers that do not have this feature. They shift as you go. Uh, 595 is a really good one because you can, for the peripheral, it can, uh, you can simulate that all the outputs are put once at a time. Um, can you give me a use uh, for use case for this register? So give me an example. Where could I use a register like this? Sorry? The processor has registers, but no. Razvan? No, 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 no. Think of peripherals, no, not on buffers and uh, uh, serial lines, communication lines. Yes? For LED screens, so on and so forth. This is the example. The blue cables over here are the serial input line, the serial clock, and the parallel clock, or R clock, the register clock. These are the eight LEDs that I want to control, and these are the outputs. As you can see, QB to QH and QA. It was, if you remember here, somehow this is, this is strangely connected. Now, using three, three lines, I can light up eight LEDs. All I need to do is compute a value in from base 2 in base 10 because I will shift the value to the register and I will shift the bits for these LEDs. Can I control 7 segment displays? I can. Can I control 2 7 segment displays? With three, so with 3 uh, pins I'm controlling 8 LEDs. Can I control 16 LEDs with 3 pins? How? Two shift registers. Can I connect? Can I uh, control 24 LEDs? Indeed. So as long as the LEDs don't need to change so fast, I can connect as many registers as, as I want. The time needed to update the LEDs will, will grow, but for two or three registers, this is not feasible. And it's very important. I can control more digits on the seven segment display with an embedded computer. Now, if the seven segment display comes with more digits and it needs multiplexing, because some seven segment displays, like this one over here with four, um, four digits, needs multiplexing because they are connected together. It doesn't have uh, 28 pins or 30 pins, 32 pins actually. It has only 12. But if I use pieces like this, uh, by all means, I can con control it. So, do you see the value of the shift register? So, always when you don't have enough pins, you can use shift registers if uh, the time for the shift is small enough. And usually it is. If you have any questions, we have the register, we'll test it today, so no problem. LCDs, this is the last peripheral that we talk about. LCDs are really fancy, so LCDs meaning not a really cool 5K screen or 4K UHD screen. But uh, two lines with 16 uh, characters on each line, or usually you can find it with four lines with 16 characters, or one line and 16 characters. We have the 16 by 2. It has 16 pins for controlling. 16, not so good. It can use two protocols, uh, four bit, a 4-bit protocol and an 8-bit protocol. So basically, if you use the 8-bit protocol, you somehow need all the 16 pins. If you need the 4-bit protocol, you only need 12 pins. But four of them are grounds and VCCs, so two grounds and two VCCs. One ground and one VCC is for powering the, the device. 
but you won't, ab won't be able to see anything on the device. So you have another VCC and power, and ground, sorry, to power the backlight. Also, you have a contrast, and you need a potentiometer to select the contrast. It has an input pin, and you can put a resistance to de determine the contrast. And also, the device can also send data back to you. You can query it, where is the cursor, and or where is this? If you don't need that, you simply connect one pin to the ground. There's also an enable pin. So that one is also usually connected. It can be connected to the ground, but usually it's to the microcontroller. So this is the LCD. Uh, this is the version that we have with 16 pins. Uh, some versions come with an, with an I2C controller. So you have the display. And on the back side, you have an I2C controller connected to it, which has a microcontroller that controls the, the LCD. If we have an I2C version, how many pins do we need? How many pins were there on I2C? Two. We need four. Why four? Exactly. We need to power the device. So VCC and ground, and usually the I2C controller has the potentiometer on it. But usually you need four. And you connect, can connect more than one displays uh, with which condition? Uh, they, use, they all use I2C. But the condition is? They don't have the same address. So the controller really has some soldering pins or jumpers where you can change this. OK, this display is in any POS that you see. Now, more ex advanced POSs have more have been larger screens. But usually, the POS for the, the card payment is done with a screen like this. OK, any questions up to here? So last topic today is signal processing. This is going to be really, really fast. As I said, we have Octave for um, signal processing. You can try to run a project in Octave on your board, but it's not going to have Octave installed. And I'm not sure you can install Octave on the Intel Edison that we use. I think the Raspberry Pi might have a version. So it looks like MATLAB. It processes signals very well. It can use export sig exported signals from the dashboard, and it can design graphs for you, or draw graphs, really professional graphs for you. How do you use it if you can't run it on the board? You have an option with an IoT server. So in Wiredrin, you can generate an IoT server, and that comes with Octave pre-installed. We'll talk about this IoT server more at the internet part. For now, just keep in mind that you have it, and you can run Octave. So when Andre is going to talk this afternoon, um, you won't need to install MATLAB if you don't have MATLAB. Um, how do you make an IoT server? Simply add a new device and select as a gadget an IoT server, give it a name, and then start it. To, make, to plot a function, it's not enough to use the plot command. Plot command, instead of drawing the graph, will draw the graph in the console with a text mode library, which is really not helpful. That's very helpful. So after plotting a graph, the difference from MATLAB is that you need to use the print function with the file name .svg. Anything .svg works. This is a limitation of Wiredrin for the moment. It only scans for SVG files. The moment you print a file, it will pop up a window with uh, the graph. Please keep in mind, browsers block pop-ups, which are not clicked. So if you do not click on a link to open a pop-up, the browser will uh, deny the pop-up. This is due to uh, advertising. Really bad advertising. So you need to go here on the left. This is Chrome, but Firefox and Opera and Safari have it similar. And allow pop-ups from Project Wired in CS Pub Row. Once you do this, uh, you have the graphs. Anyway, in the dashboard, you will have a list of files and graphs that you have. Simply click on it, and it will display. So this, w this was the course for today. If you have any questions, please do. OK, thank you.